Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the Fam Vester podcast. Today, we're talking about the 50 actions I took towards my financial independence. So we're not completely there yet, but we're in our 90% financially independent. And that just means, you know, that our passive income streams and 4% of our investment assets are equate to our annual expenses. So 90% of that is covered. So once we hit 100%, we'll be completely financially independent. This doesn't necessarily mean that I'll quit my job or anything. But you know, I won't have to be working for that paycheck, I won't be relying on it. And I think the goal right now is to achieve 125% financial independence rate prior to considering uh, moving on. So with that, I want to get back to the 50 actions. Oh, before I do that, quick announcement for those viewing. Check out this t-shirt. Fam Vester t-shirt. Um, first prototype design. Thinking about rolling these out. Uh, excited to wear it. Uh, I was talking this evening at an event um, where I was talking all about financial independence and living your life on purpose. Got to wear the shirt. So got some good feedback on that. Anyway, about the 50 actions, you know, these kind of run the gamut. Um, it's all about, you know, achieving financial independence. But you know, I'm talking about how actions I took on my job actions I took throughout college, uh, actions surrounding vehicles, you know, car flipping, but also vehicles I bought, um, and then investing in the market, you know, whether through stocks or IRAs or 401ks. I talk about uh, how do I save money, you know, what actions I take regarding food and services I use, regarding my education, regarding travel, regarding just being bold in life, and regarding housing and budgeting. So definitely spans the gamut. So these are 50 actionable steps that you too can incorporate into your lives to help you achieve financial independence faster. So with that, let's get right into it. You're listening to the FamVestor Podcast. If you're looking to raise your family with intention, gain financial independence, and live a life of true freedom, you're in the right place. Join us as we explore together how to create thriving families, because strong families are the cornerstone for a world at peace. So I want to explain that 4% rule again real quick, just because it is very fundamental to financial independence. And basically, the 4% rule is based on the stock market. And basically, uh, investment assets grow at an average of 8% a year. So the, the thought behind 4% rule is if you withdraw at 4%, um, you know, so if you have a million dollars in the bank, you withdraw 4% of that, that's $40,000 a year, you withdraw. The hope is, and historically speaking, that million dollars should grow $80,000 each year. So if you withdraw 40,000, you know, 4%, you should be safe because your investment should continually grow past what you're taking out. So so the idea is, if you need 40,000 to live, then you only need a million dollars in investment assets. Otherwise, you know, maybe you need more, maybe you need 80,000. At that point, you would need $2 million. So that's that 4% safe withdrawal rate. Us, you know, Sunmarie and I were real estate investors. So we have passive income coming through rental income. So we count our rental income plus the 4% of our investment uh, assets. And that's how we get our total kind of passive income. And we divide that by our expenses and get that financial independence rate. So right now, you know, not all of our passive income uh, meets our entire expenses, but we're 90% of the way there. So we're close. Okay, so the 50 actions. Action number one. So we're starting in the jobs category. I started snow shoveling when I was very little. You know, I just started uh, with my brother and a friend, and we would go door to door knocking. Uh, usually, old people really wanted our services. We just had shovels, and we just, uh, you know, plow them out with our uh, snow shoveling. And it'd take us like 30 minutes to an hour or two to do a house, depending on the snowfall. But we'd get, you know, 20 to 100 bucks per house. So it was a good way to make money when we were little. Um, from there, you know, I started selling things on eBay and just learning kind of entrepreneurship, listing pr things and uh, yeah, just selling things on eBay that I would find. I'd even like go to garage sales, buy cheap things and then resell them for hire on eBay. Uh, I did a little bit of fundraising. Um, so to buy my motorcycle, actually, when I was 17 years old, around the 4th of July, I bought all these glow sticks off some, I think off eBay, you know, I just bought 100 packs of glow sticks, and then I would sell them for a dollar a piece. Uh, so you know, like a 10 times markup. 
at uh, fireworks, 4th of July events. And that's how I bought my first motorcycle. And I'll go into why I bought a motorcycle instead of a car. But after that, another job I had was working as a dishwasher. I worked as a custodian at my high school over the summer. And um, my final kind of regular job was working as a cashier at Taco Bell. I really loved that job. But, you know, working there, my plan was I'm going to work there for six months and then I'm going to build up enough capital to start my car flipping business. So that's exactly what I did. I worked there for six months and on my last day, you know, I had to hand it in my two weeks notice. On my last day, I had around $1,500 and I bought my first car that same day I quit my job. And I bought it for thirteen fifty and sold it for twenty eight hundred dollars um, two weeks later. You know, so uh, and that was the start of my car flipping business. From there, you know, I went on to buy and sell nineteen cars throughout my college career, and that funded my tuition, or at least the gap in my tuition between my student loans and everything like that. Um, I've also sold a lot of things on Amazon. Um, you know, we sell pacifiers on Amazon right now. And yeah, so those are some action steps I took regarding jobs. So in college, you know, I commuted from home and that was a way to save a lot of money. I didn't have to pay like $10,000 a year in dorming fees. Um, and I got good grades, so I qualified for a lot of merit scholarship. I applied for FAFSA and, you know, we got a lot of financial aid through that. I did a work study. So I was working as a machinist at my college at Stevens Institute of Technology Machine Shop. So I got to learn a lot of hands-on skills. I got to learn a, a little bit of background on engineering and mechanical design. And so that was through my work study. So I got paid, um, I think it was 9 to $10 an hour. But uh, that was the way I made money. Um, and then I received the DoD Smart Scholarship. I have a blog post on this, fanvestor.com slash smart. And that, you know, kind of changed the trajectory of my life because it was a full tuition scholarship I got in my junior and senior year. It guaranteed me a job with the Department of Defense as a research engineer, civilian, uh, for, the, for, for two years. Um, it's kind of forced recruitment scholarship, so I had to work for them at full salary. Uh, but anyway, the, it, was, it wasn't just full tuition paid, but they also gave me $25,000 cash in my pocket each year I got the award. So my junior, senior year, I got twenty five k each year. It was pretty tremendous. Um, so definitely I would, uh, anyone in a uh, STEM field, you know, that's science, technology, engineering, and um, math, I would definitely look into that scholarship because it's such a good program. And the acceptance rates is pretty high. It's like 10% acceptance rate. And you just have to be in a STEM field and maintain over a 3.0 GPA. Really, to be competitive, you should have a 3.5 or so. But, you know, I got it. A friend of mine has got it. Two other friends were semifinals this year, so they were close. Um, so it's definitely doable. Go for that scholarship. It's open now, opened in August, and it closes in December. So check it out. You have to be at least a freshman enrolled in college, and you do have to be a U.S. citizen and some other citizenships too. But check out the blog post about more about that scholarship. Okay, moving on from college, some action steps I took around vehicles. You know, vehicles is a major expense. I'd say like housing and then vehicles, you know, is almost a secondary. But uh, vehicles is huge. And like I said, I used to buy and sell cars. So I was very savvy with cars by the time it came. And okay, so the motorcycle. Why did I buy a motorcycle as my first vehicle? The reason was uh, car insurance is so much more expensive than motorcycle insurance. In my area, northern New Jersey, for me, when I was 17 years old, to own a car and insure it would have been around $2,000 a year. Motorcycle insurance instead was $300 a year. So much cheaper, you know, almost 10% of the price. Uh, a little more than that, but close, you know, $300 a year, very manageable for me. I was getting 55 miles per gallon. I could buy a fairly new motorcycle. I had a Kawasaki Ninja 500 that I bought for $2,000. Uh, or was it 2500 Anyway, in that ballpark range, uh, very affordable. And like I said, I fundraised to get it. And it was cheap transportation. I could take to and from college, to and from work. And, you know, I avoided car payments or leasing. Um just by buying an affordable motorcycle and you know car payments um you know you're paying so much in interest fees leasing there's all these hidden fees you know that you get hit with a surcharge right up front for leasing these leasing tax fees and then you know you you get charged with fees if you drive too much and things like that um and you know after a while you know i needed a car 
and I bought a used 40 mile per gallon, low maintenance, roll up windows, 1.5 liter Toyota Yaris. So a subcompact car. And you know what? And in my post, fanvessel.com slash cars, I talk about what my ideal, reliable, cheap car is. And that's a Japanese subcompact car that's five years old, around 50,000 mile mark. And single owner, you know, single owner is a big deal, especially if you can, if they have meticulous maintenance records, you can see the pride of ownership. And generally, I'd say if you can pay $5,000 for a car like this, you know, just five years old, 50,000 miles, um, you know, these cars are only like 15,000 brand new. So it is doable to do this. I feel like that's your best bang for your buck. And that car is going to last you a long time. My wife, my wife's Honda Fit 2009, my 2009 Toyota Yaris, both lasting us. We had to do like no maintenance. I think we changed her battery, um, changed my brakes. There's really been nothing we've had to do. These cars are reliable. You know, we put on another 60,000 miles on them each, and they're still lasting like a dream. So definitely that's my ideal criteria in selecting the best bang for buck car. Okay, moving on from vehicles, now to market investing. You know, a lot of people, when they hear investing, all they think about is stocks and buying and selling stocks. You know, I'm into real estate investing, but, you know, when I first got started investing, it was with stocks. You know, I would just, I opened up a Scott Trade uh, brokerage account. Scott Trade no longer exists, bought out by TD Ameritrade. But, you know, I bought Toyota, things I knew. I bought Netflix. And um, I've since moved on from buying stocks, but that was a great, you know, foundational knowledge, just buying little pieces of stocks and watching them grow and seeing what happens. And I moved on to buying index funds, which are like large um, conglomeration of different companies into a fund. So for instance, I buy in the S&P 500. So it's the five top 500 American companies. And uh, it's a lot safer method of investing. If you want to know more uh, uh, check out fanvestor.com slash Roth and I talk a lot about index funds um, okay another action I took is regarding 401ks 401ks are you know um, investment accounts related to your workplace and a lot of places a lot of workplaces will match a certain portion so for instance at my work they match the first five percent I put into my 401k they match it dollar for dollar so if I put in you know, if I if I put in five percent of my paycheck towards my thrift savings plan or four hundred one k, they will match it dollar for dollar. So instantly, I double my money. You know, five percent of my hundred thousand dollars salary that's five thousand dollars. That five thousand dollars turns into ten thousand dollars instantly. It's an instant hundred percent return, instant doubling of money. That's huge. Everyone should do that. If you have a match definitely do that right away. And then, you know, I started maxing out my retirement account. So with your 401k, you can put up to $18,000 a year. With your IRA, you know, and I recommend the Roth IRA, especially if you're young and you are in a lower tax bracket, um, I definitely recommend the Roth IRA and you can put up to $6,000. So collectively, you can put in uh, 6,000 plus 18,000, that is $24,000. Did I do that right? I think I did. $24,000. So that's a huge sum of money that you can be putting away tax deductible, you know, at least one way, tax deferred. And um, yeah, it's a huge uh, action step towards your financial independence. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that, take a listen to episode four of the Fan Investor podcast where I talk about managing your money with mastery. Okay, on to food and services. So this is a huge one because these are like daily expenditures and daily expenditures really add up. You know, I always only order water uh, to drink at restaurants because, you know, water, uh, if you order soda or something, you know, usually it's like $2 a pop. You're paying tip on that. You're paying tax on that. So with tip, it's like 20% with taxes and 7% New Jersey. So that's 27% marked onto the $2. It just adds up every time you go out. So I just drink water. It's healthiest. It's cheapest. It works for me. Um, you know, and I try not to go to restaurants that require tip and I don't, we don't eat at restaurants very often at all. Maybe once or twice, once a week maximum, usually like twice a month. Um, and we choose restaurants with takeout or that don't require a tip because tip really does add up. 
Uh, I don't pay for haircuts. You know, uh, my wife just takes the buzzer and buzzes my hair. And I do that like twice, once every two months or so. So I just go really short. So that saves time. You know, I don't have to wait in any barbershop lines. And it's quick. It's cheap. It's fast. It's efficient. We bought a buzzer like 30 years, no, 30 years ago, uh, three years ago. And it was a wall buzzer, you know, $30 on Amazon Prime. And it's been great, you know, very quick, very efficient. And that's a buzz cut. Very simple. Uh, we don't drink coffee or alcohol. So that's a huge expense. You know, most people on a daily basis, I think on average, spend $2 or $3 on coffee. And if you think about that, $3 over, you know, every day of the year, that's a $1,000 you're spending just on coffee. And, you know, if you add up all these things like coffee, haircuts, haircuts, I think on average, people are spending $30 a month. So that's another, you know, like $330 a year. Um, breakfast, you know, lunch, dinner, we, you know, we pack our own food, we cook at home. So all these things add up these little expenditures that you spend every day add up. So I, you know, we always pack our own uh, lunch to school to work. Um, and that's a huge action step you can take towards your financial freedom. And it's healthier too, generally, you know, it's not going to be as salty, it's not going to be as flavored, uh, it's going to be just healthier for you. And I really urge to avoid as many subscription services as you can, you know, they're out there every day, you know, it's just, and you think it's just $5 a month for that Spotify subscription, but it adds up because that adds with the Netflix subscription you have with the Amazon Prime subscription you have with whatever everything you know will add up and it stacks and stacks and just takes away from your spending power and your saving power. So you know, if you want you know, that's a huge action step. Stay away from those uh, subscription services. And another, you know, service is cell phones. Everyone needs cell phones. And we have one of the cheapest cell phone plans, which is the T-Mobile family plan. I don't think it really exists anymore, but we were able to have up to 10 lines on our T-Mobile family plan. And that brought us down to around $20 a line for unlimited talk, unlimited text, unlimited data. Data is throttled up to two and a half gigs, but it's a fantastic service if you can get on that T-Mobile family plan. Uh, another step, no TV. We don't own a TV. You know, that was an intentional decision, mainly for the benefit of the kids, you know, and uh, us not having to rely on a TV as a babysitter. We just wanted to make that intentional decision as a family. Uh, we don't feel that TV adds value to our lives. Um, you know, on average, the average American spends five and a half hours a day on TV. That's five and a half hours you could spend working on your dreams like we are doing. Um, so definitely, uh, that's a huge action step towards freedom. Uh, maybe not directly correlate the finances, but if you can spend five and a half hours on a business, it definitely correlates. So think about that. Uh, internet bill, you know, we share an internet bill. So we live in a two family house. So we actually share with upstairs, uh, uh, at the internet bill and a half. Uh, I stopped playing video games. Again, that's also another time waster. So I'd rather invest it in the blog, in my pursuits, my purpose, teaching others about financial independence. So now moving on to education action steps. So education, and by education, I kind of mean like financial independence or personal finance education. And this is key because the more you know the better you equipped you are to save and to grow your savings, to grow your investments. So for me, one of the biggest was to start listening to podcasts. And I listened to things like Bigger Pockets, which ta taught me about real estate investing and getting rid of my housing expense. And another great podcast I listened to was Mad Scientist, which was all about, you know, radical um, savings rates and personal finance too, so that you can retire early. And those were just inspiring things that gave me ideas and goals and a purpose to strive for. Uh, and I listened to a lot of audiobooks, um, all about you know self help category, about leadership and growing myself and developing myself, and you know in the categories I'm interested in. So things like real estate investing, you know, um, some great books to recommend are things like Richest Man in Babylon, Millionaire Next Door, The 4-Hour Workweek, all have been instrumental in my journey towards financial independence. 
And yeah, to access those, you know, you can use your local library. Library is great. And especially if you get a, you know, online library, uh, usually you can pull from a network with, at least in my Bergen County, I can pull from any Bergen County town and pull whatever resources they have and they'll just deliver it to my library. I pick it up and you could get audio books. You can get hardcover books, anything you want. Some, some uh, libraries even give you an app that you can start downloading audio books. And then there's Audible and Audible, you know, I have so many free trials of audible because i love to be cheap and so i've opened multiple accounts and just had free audible um, trials so that's a way you can do it too another action step uh, in terms of education is i started just saying yes to a lot of opportunities that fell in my lap and that just kind of helped me expand my circle of influence influence you know i would step outside my comfort zone i would meet people you know whether through uh, engaging in things like Toastmasters or uh, fellowship programs or meetups. You know, now I host my own real estate investment meetup and I meet people all the time. That's expanding my circle of influence, surrounding myself with like minded people who are growing themselves, developing themselves. So, you know, I would really tell you that one of the best action steps to take in terms of education, developing yourself is just to start to welcome change and put yourself out there. Leave your comfort zone. Instead of watching TV tonight, you know, go to a meetup. Up, go to a club uh, and it doesn't have to be finances related but you owe you know if you do something um, that's developmental you'll meet people who are also into developmental who aren't just sitting at home watching TV but are into growing themselves and if you can surround yourself with those kind of people you know that has the most influence in your life Okay, in regards to travel, so I talk a lot about this in episode two of the Fanvestor podcast, but uh, we got into credit card hacking, and that is just using you know credit card airline cards to travel for free. You know these these credit cards would give you huge sign up bonuses, and we would use that to fly to Japan for free, fly to Europe fly to uh, Puerto Rico. We've flown so many flights for free. Even with the kids, we took a trip to Alaska. It was great. And it's a way to save so much money and still, you know, experience those hobbies, experience those travels uh, on a budget. And um, another great tip for traveling is we always uh, take the action of staying with family and friends. And that way we reduce our lodging costs. We get to meet uh, other locals. Anyway, a lot of these tips, I go into more details in episode two, if you're interested. Um, another great uh, action we take is using uh, Armed Forces Vacations Club, AV AFV Club. And basically we can get like excess inventory Wyndham resorts for uh, week long stays for like uh, two, 290 bucks, something like that. And uh, we've done buy one, get one freeze from there. Anyway, more in episode two as well for that one. Uh, and we always cook meals on vacation. You know, uh, we try to get through the AFV club, like three bedroom with full kitchens. And so we'll actually bring extended family with us. We just take turns uh, cooking meals. And that way we reduce costs, eat healthy, and I'll, you know, take uh, responsibility for our meals. Uh, so that's a cool thing. And one other tip for travel, if you are uh, kind of on a budget but still want to eat well, buffets are a great option. You know, usually I'll skip breakfast and just go to a lunch buffet. And so that'll cover, you know, I'm hungry for it. And at lunch, that'll, if I eat enough, you know, I don't even have to eat dinner. So one meal, even though buffets are usually more expensive than a regular meal, if it pays for three meals, that's not too bad. So buffets are a good option uh, for travel. Okay, next category is boldness. And what do I mean by boldness? So one boldness action I'm kind of fond of taking that I've been doing throughout the majority of my life is just like asking for compensation or exchanges. Like if something happens, I'll request companies to help me out or, you know, save face. And a lot of times companies will do that. Like just last week, you know, I was on a business trip to Colorado and we had a delayed flight and the first flight smelled like sewage for whatever reason. So I sent them an email, united.com slash we care or something. And I said, hey, you know, my flight just wasn't as expected. I love United, but for some reason there was a mechanical difficulty. We were three hour delayed. I missed my meeting and they ended up giving me $150 credit. You know, and that was just one simple email I wrote. And I've done this time over time, you know, I had these nice reef sandals and they broke on me after, you know, two or three months and I, I mailed them and I was like, hey, you know, really disappointed about this. They gave me another set of uh, free sandals. I've even gotten free White Castle vouchers for complaining of White Castle. Um, I've gone to uh, 
yeah, anyway, over and over again, I do this. So if you don't ask, nothing will happen. Just ask. And 95% of the time, something good will happen. I'll get a freebie. I'll get a gift card. I'll get a replacement product. So definitely ask, you know, ask for exchanges or compensations. Uh, and then another action step in the boldness category is applying for jobs or just putting yourself out there, really. Um, I feel like in my job, you know, I've been able to go from a $50,000 salary to a six figure salary in about five year time, which is kind of incredible and really fast. And I feel like the reason I was able to do that is because I've been so bold. You know, I do a lot more than is asked of me and I really put myself out there and I you know I, because of my financial independence I'm not as scared of losing my job and because of that I take risks that get the job done well and but it's you know there's some risk to me um, for instance actually I'm not going to share that but you know just putting yourself out there taking risks and making moves and boldness I feel like really shows especially to your supervisor it gets recognized because they they definitely appreciate um, boldness. Okay, with that one, I'm gonna move on to housing. So housing is huge. It's usually like almost 50% of your paycheck goes directly to housing, which is crazy. So if you can save on housing, it's, it's huge. So anyway, when we were first starting out, my wife and I, we lived at home, and you can hear more about this in episode four, you know, again, managing money with master. We talk about how we save $75,000 in two years. But a bar, large portion of that was choosing to live at home. So we lived at my parents' house. And this was a big sacrifice because it was nine adults, one baby even at one point, and nine adults, one baby, just one bathroom in this house. So kind of crazy, but it was a sacrifice we made, an action step we made towards our financial independence. Huge. You know, we paid my parents $500 a month rent for just the bedroom we had. and But it still, it was significantly cheaper than anything we could have gotten on our own. And then from there, we started house hacking. So that's episode five, where we talk about house hacking. You know, we now have three investment properties. But because of that first house hack, where we bought a four family property, we had three tenants that paid the rent, paid the mortgage, paid the insurance, paid the taxes, and we were able to live for free in the fourth unit and still make like $100, $200 a month. And then from there, we were able to grow and buy another three family and then buy another four family all in the New York City area. So kind of crazy. But um, yeah, house hacking is huge. Getting rid of that housing expense is huge. And a lot of people talk about Airbnb, you know, uh, buying a house and maybe you have a three bedroom house and you just need one and you rent out the other two via Airbnb. So we're actually experimenting with Airbnb now. Uh, we're taking a spare room that was just housing storage, just junk really, and converting that to a nice Airbnb space. So uh, definitely tune into that. We'll be updating you as we progress on that. Should be done by the end of the month. We have our first tenant staying August 26th. So that's our hard deadline to get that done. So that's another action. So our last category and one of the most important is probably budgeting. So one huge step for me was, and I think I just lucked out here, was marrying a thrifty wife. You know, my wife and I are on the same page. We both have the same financial goals, same purpose that we're pursuing and going towards. You know, no, no, no one in the relationship is sabotaging our finances. Uh, we're all working together um, towards this one common goal of financial freedom. And, you know, that's huge. If one of you is not part of it, you know, um, I don't know what to really suggest. Maybe just, you know, allow them to listen to podcasts or um, resources. But really, if you, you grow up like, you know, pursuing status symbols and things, it might be hard to break free from that. But maybe with some, you know, resources, you could break free from that. But that's a huge action step. I don't know. That's a funny one. But um, another thing my wife and I did that was huge was making savings uh, making saving money a game, you know, we would have apps tracking our expenses. And the more I don't know, it's just it's nice to save. And when you start tracking that savings, and seeing that grow, it's something that you can both be inspired with. And if you can make it a game, it's definitely something fun. We definitely like being thrifty, like seeing how much we could save on things that other people spend 10 times more than us on. And it's definitely a game for us. So again, I mentioned tracking expenses. Tracking expenses is huge. You know, I recommend listening to episode four again, uh, managing your money with mastery, where I talk about, you know, Finja, the financial 
uh, independent spreadsheet that I created. A great way to track all your expenses and really plan your budget, plan your future. So I definitely recommend that. And setting a budget, you can also do that through Finja. But you know, my wife and I, we just had a cash budget. So um, you know, just withdrawing four hundred fifty dollars a month each for all our cash expenditures, anything out of pocket, we would just start with the four hundred fifty dollars and just try to spend from that. And I think using only cash is a huge tip, a huge action. Because even though you know you get great credit card rewards. Uh, nothing replaces cash. You know, when you start out with a stack of Benjamins at the beginning of the month and they start going away, it's really motivating for you to hold on to them and keep them. Using a plastic credit card, you don't even notice when you're spending money. So that's a huge action step. So I hope you enjoyed those 50 actions I took to become financially independent or on my journey towards financial independence. I hope this helps you on your journey. Uh, if you have any feedback for us, definitely call us on our number or you know, send me an email you know, on the contact us page at fanvest.com slash contact. And uh, always looking for feedback. And if you can, you know, just take a second to leave us a rating. Um, just, give us, uh, just hop on iTunes, leave us a rating. Uh, if you can subscribe to the show, definitely that helps us out. Uh, and if you have a, um, you know, someone in your life that you think could benefit from what, the, what we're sharing here on the podcast, definitely send them a link. And uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for being a listener. And uh, we'll catch you on the next podcast, which should be about um, we're going to interview a person who, you know, retired from the military, you know, just putting in eight years of service, but retiring with six figures in uh, net worth. Um, you know, a lot of my friends entered the military, you know, didn't have any housing expenses or meals or living expenses at all. But, you know, they bought fancy cars and they just left the military with debt even. Um, but this person did it differently, and I think it's a great path and um, channel for us to view how to save money on uh, maybe smaller income. But um, yeah, just take advantage of all of the perks that are given to you. So I think it's an episode everyone can enjoy, and it's uh, one that I'm looking forward to. So um, with that, thanks for listening. Good luck on all your pursuits. Godspeed.